Hello everyone, it's Ross Raddy and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk all about fruits, vegetables, um, things that are a bit unique really and how to do all that, how to grow it, how to use it in the kitchen, um, really things you probably never heard of. So let's get on with it. In this episode of uh, Fruit Talk, we're going to talk all about vegetables and probably my top five, the easiest to grow vegetables I would consider the easiest to grow here in my climate and probably in your climate as well. Uh, most temperate zones are really going to have the same um, results that I have in my yard. So let's get on to it. The first thing I want to mention is actually tomatoes. And I know tomatoes um, can be a bit tricky. You know, there's a whole family of different crops that you could kind of refer to tomatoes, right? There's um, Peppers are in the, the same family, uh, eggplant, right? They're all in the, this, the nightshade family. Um, even ground cherries, believe it or not. And I just think that tomatoes are probably one of the easier ones um, of the three. Really, even in, in colder climates, you can really get away with growing some tomatoes. Uh, even in my climate, I can direct seed them in the ground, not start them early, and still get a great crop of um of tomatoes off certain varieties whereas peppers and eggplants if I were to do that it's really uh, nowhere near uh, as easy it's quite difficult actually my seasons not as long the fruits are usually larger take a bit more energy um, you know different rates that the plants grow in of, of course and I would say overall tomatoes are mostly problem free at least in my yard um, completely problem free nothing bothers them at all I don't even have critters trying to get after them. Um, I don't have any fruit fly. F ugh, excuse me, guys. I don't have any fruit fly problems. Um, now there is one big problem that some of you guys can run into, which is either splitting or, or cracking. Um, you can also get blossom end rot, and you can also have lots of disease with the foliage. And the way that I train my tomatoes really makes them absolutely effortless. Uh, and problem free. I mean, not. I wouldn't. I shouldn't say effortless. Um, there is some work involved, but the way I do it is I train them vertically. I train them up trellises, up poles. I grow them as single stem plants. I don't use tomato cages. Um, I really think that's an inferior way to grow a tomato. And the reason, the whole reason being, is because you're getting a lot more tomatoes actually in a smaller space by growing them vertically. Instead of letting one tomato plant bush out and really get probably in a three foot by three foot space, it could ev eventually take up in an entire season. Um, you can have nine plants in that same nine square foot space. One tomato plant grown vertically only needs one square foot. So that three by three space now becomes nine plants. You not only have uh, you know multiple. Um, varieties you have multiple flavors but you also have better disease resistance because they're grown with better airflow um, the other techniques that you use is you always prune the bottom leaves and you work your way up as you harvest and clear out different trusses of tomatoes from the bottom up you always clean out all that old those old leaves and those old trusses and it really keeps the plants problem free um, blossom end rot really is all because of your soil for the most part or even some water you know coming down from the the earth and then coming up and hitting the leaves right that's a different disease but you know all that stuff really is stemming from the ground and if you can kind of keep your plants off the ground you won't have these problems um, so training them up a, a trellis just it just makes a whole lot of sense and by me growing them here in this climate I'm actually was able to get a bowl like this that for those of you guys who are watching this on YouTube I, I probably got I had so many tomatoes I couldn't keep up with them that I gave away quite a few and we only had roughly um, about nine tomato plants right I was eating cherry tomatoes every day I had salad tomatoes I had the beef steaks as well and really, I just couldn't I couldn't keep up with all of it. Um, I will say that I also was able, because I'm growing them vertically, I was able to extend my season much later in the year because our fall is quite rainy. 
quite humid. And that's where sh people really struggle is towards the end of the year with their tomato plants. They get a lot of disease. They don't really produce very well. The temperatures obviously start to cool down. Um, mine just kept going. I have them in the perfect spot. I have them in a great microclimate that gets a lot of sun. There's a lot of heat in that location. It's closer to the house. Um, I just have it down. There's nothing really that bothers them. The one thing you may struggle with, I should say, is Fusarium wilt. And that's a soil-borne disease as well that eventually kills the plant. And you can't really plant um, tomato plants in, that, in those locations for quite a long time. So if you've got something like that, you know, that's probably not something you're going to want to grow. But, um, you know, that's, in my mind, the worst thing that could happen and probably realistically the only thing that really will happen in my yard that uh, could ruin these tomatoes for me. Uh, moving on to the next vegetable here. Uh, Swiss chard is extremely easy to grow. In terms of lettuces or leafy greens, it's probably the easiest to grow leafy green that I have. There are some Asian type greens that I'm really experimenting with now, like um, Komatsuna, I think is one of them. Uh, let's see. There's also uh, Tatsui. So oh, there's also Mizuna, right? But those are Mizuna is more of like a mustard. I'm talking about really like a a real leafy salad type green that you could then use really and not and not get too bitter, not get too um, spicy on you. This is a real nice refreshing green that stays refreshing, at least in my yard. Um, and I plant this thing really about mid uh, mid March. I could probably get away with it. Um, historically, I've done April first, and then what what's happened is I've had those plants throughout the entirety of the year. Sometimes I cut them back and they re-sprout and kind of it's like cut and come again. Um, and then they last me this year all the way until December. We had this really nasty frost that came in sometime in i think january so if you're looking at the photo here excuse me guys i'm really having a tough time with my voice today if you're looking at the photo these are these uh swiss chard plants and the photo is taken on january 20th so on january 20th they still looked great i could still harvest from them shortly after that though they did get totally killed off by a frost so you know they're not going to be there forever but i mean i could maybe even transplant them out now i would be surprised if i couldn't because what's really the biggest difference between january 20th and february 20th if you think about it most of the cold temperatures the really cold lows that are going to happen are already happened they're already gone they're behind us so uh, this thing just lives forever, and it's really easy to grow. Nothing really bothers it. There are some, the cabbage moth, right? Um, there is, uh, let's see, what were the white flies I had this year as well. But out of all the, the brassicas and all those different things that th get affected by that, the Swiss chard was like the last one. Um, it really is just above and beyond, in my opinion. Maybe I have like a, a better strain, right? A better variety. I, this is the Verde de Taglio that uh, Baker Creek sells. It's an old heirloom, you know, that probably has adapted to certain things over the years. So, you know, I would suggest getting that variety. But overall, I think Swiss chard does exceptionally well. Another one I'm going to try out is Perpetual Spinach this year and have those two alongside each other, comparing them and seeing which one is, uh, is better or if they're different enough so that I should grow them both. Uh, the per perpetual spinach, you know, is a type of chard, but actually tastes a lot like spinach. So I actually think the Verde de the Taglio reminds me a bit of spinach, but I think this variety actually tastes like um, shrimp. As crazy as that sounds, a lettuce that tastes like shrimp. Uh, in my mind, it does. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but uh, I that's what I pick up every time I bite into a nice tender piece of chard moving on um, I think root crops the majority of them are extremely easy to grow very rewarding you know um, 
Tomatoes, as an example, we didn't really mention this, but the difference between a store-bought tomato and a homegrown tomato is insane. I don't even buy store-bought tomatoes anymore. I can't eat them. I, I literally can't eat them. Uh, they're that inferior to what you can grow. And I would say root crops are not too inferior in the store, but they certainly are inferior. Um, and they're just so easy to grow that it seems like why grow, why even buy them? The other big thing here with the root crop when you're getting them at the store is that if they're not organic, that's really a bad thing. Um, you know, they can contain lots of heavy metals, even in organic fields. That's what a lot of farmers do is they plant lots of root crops to get the heavy metals out of their fields. And uh, I really would stay away from, you know, store-bought uh, root crops if I, if you could. Uh, and you know what? Radishes, turnips, beets, carrots, potatoes. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Even yacone you can grow and, and uh, Jerusalem artichokes. It's all extremely easy, guys. Uh, you literally plant the seed or you plant the potato and you're done. Um, it's really, really simple. Um, I would say peanuts are a bit more difficult to get finer tuned and you, you have to do some processing to the peanuts afterwards, right? You wanna, I think you wanna roast them for the most part. Um, you know, but other, for the most part, I, most root crops are really a joke. You can even grow a lot of them in, um, because they are a root crop and they're naturally grown in, um, you know, underneath trees and whatnot, underneath as a ground cover, you don't really, they don't really need full sun. You know, they may not get the largest size turnips or the largest size carrots, but they're going to be tender and they're going to be really good, you know, and a lot of people go crazy for larger fruits or larger vegetables when in reality, a lot of this stuff is just better when it's smaller. Um, the Hakurai turnip there is what you're looking at. This is a white turnip. It's called a snow apple, they call it in certain places. It's incredible, uh, especially grown in, in colder temperatures. It's insane. It's very sweet. They're so, so good. I, I even have them still in my fridge to this day that I think I harvested um, probably back in, I would say September or October, maybe late September, early October. I mean, that's just nuts if you think about it. Excuse me, guys. So root crops, again, really, really simple. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is peas and beans because most peas and most beans are just again a joke you gotta get certain conditions for certain things right like peas like to be grown mostly in colder climates and colder um, temperatures so earlier in your season or late in the season um, beans you know really like the warmer temperatures you gotta have a little bit um, usually around 60 degrees Fahrenheit at the soil level so you really want um, between the two of them, I should say, they really cover my bases the entire year. I'll plant a whole bunch of snap peas early out in the year, and sugar snap peas are incredible. There's many types of peas, by the way, but in my mind, excuse me, oh my god, the sugar snap peas are just unbelievable. Uh, they are far and away my favorite vegetable. Um, they're extremely sweet. They're very good early in the season. It's like the first vegetable you can really snack on. I mean, maybe you could get radishes that you could snack on. The Hakurai turnips you could certainly snack on. Maybe you get like a really early carrot. But, oh man, the sugar snap peas, I can't wait to eat them in about two months from now. I'm going to be really enjoying them. Um, so, you know, I would totally recommend both of them any kind of bean any kind of uh pea realistically because you you just plant the pea or the bean they have really great germination and um they form really strong plants in no time a lot of them suck the nitrogen out of the air and put that in their soil so they don't really need a whole lot of extra help growing they don't need uh you know the best soil conditions they don't really need too much of this too much of that they're like one of the least the last things you should baby in my mind um they really are just so easy nothing bothers them um i'm sure there are some different like different pests that bother all the things that i've mentioned 
But at least in my yard, nothing. Um, it's really a joke. I love string beans as well, and that's considered a bean, right? The string beans, as an example, I eat them fresh off the plant. And I remember my great grand, my grandfather telling me he grew up during the Great Depression. My grandfather told me that his grandmother or his mother used to take him out and his brother, the three of them, used to go out to fields where there are string beans, and he used to pick them and he used to eat them right off the plant. And I said, "Are you nuts? What are you doing eating string beans off the plant? Where you got to cook them first? What are you talking about?" He said, "No, not these string beans. They're really, really good. You could just eat them." And it wasn't until I grew them myself that I realized that you don't even have to cook string beans. They're so tender, they're so sweet, they're so delicious. They don't need butter, they don't need olive oil, they don't need salt. They're actually incredibly good. Um, and I love to just snack on them in the garden. This is really some of my greatest snacking foods is peas and beans. Um, really fills a nice gap. What you're looking at here though is soybeans. This is edamame that I made. And soybeans, again, super easy to grow. They fix nitrogen. It's one of the biggest crops in the world, right? Um, you can just undoubtedly plant some seed. You don't even have to water the seed. I planted the seed in wood chips before, <laughs> no soil. And they grew and they put out you know, multiple crops of soybeans. So that I can make, I make roughly about that sized bowl in a really small patch of soybeans. I make that sized bowl about six times a year. Um, and this is like a really uh, huge bowl of soybeans. And you know what? I picked them myself. I got them the exact ripeness that I wanted. And they're completely filled with giant beans not the really small beans or very few beans in a pod you know these are really really high quality and it's so easy to make edamame guys you boil it you add some salt you're done i mean i've, I've even done a video on it for those of you guys who are interested in how to make edamame it's so simple it's one of my favorite snacks again really easy to process all of these things very easy to process and easy to grow uh, the last thing I want to mention here, this is number five. This is uh, garlic. And it, realistically, though, any of the alliums are extremely easy to grow. I mean, you can get, you could say that leeks are a bit harder to grow because you got to hill up some soil. You got to figure out how to do that. But you don't have to hill up the soil, right? Alliums, believe it or not, grow wild in your yard. Most yards throughout the Northeast you'll find alliums all over your yard. You won't even know that they're there, Ch whether it's chives, onions, leeks, um, you know, wild garlic ramps, as an example. They're all extremely, extremely easy to grow. And you know what? They're easy to propagate too, which is really cool. I like the same thing with potatoes. You take a potato, you stick it in the ground. You take a clove of garlic, you stick it in the ground. It's just really, really cool. And I love that that's how it works. Um, it just makes things a lot more simple in terms of garlic. There's an extra learning step, right? You got to learn how to cure it. You got to learn how to store it um, But really it's not that difficult. I, I, I truly believe that uh, And you know what I do with the garlic and all the other alliums I plant them out and I, That's it. I don't care for them one little bit. They nothing bothers them. No pest. No disease If you do everything right at planting time, you're done and with the amount of rain we have in my climate, 40 inches of rain annually, I don't water a single thing, all right? So <laughs> let me tell you guys, it really is this simple. And I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Um, and I hope this one inspired you guys to grow some of these different things. Last episode of Fruit Talk, we talked about the five fruits that are perennial, that are very easy to grow. I think some of them were uh, berries. We got blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, persimmon, and mulberries. Those were the five right there that are extremely, extremely easy to grow. Certainly would complement these very well. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning into this one, and I'll talk to everyone later. Take care.